Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Ramazan Kılınç. I am a professor of political science and the director of Islamic studies program at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, Islamic studies program is an interdisciplinary program housed at College of Arts and Sciences. We organize events like this one for the public and offer a minor program for UNO students. I know we have UNO students among us today. Please contact me if you are interested in minoring in Islamic studies. Today, we are lucky to host Dr. Nazif Shahrani, a top scholar, or I should have said the top scholar of Islam and politics in Afghanistan. Uh, today's event is the 12th in our series, Dialogue with Muslim Communities in Omaha. Through these events, we try to improve knowledge on Muslims and foster, uh, and foster mutual understanding in our communities. These civic conversations have only been possible thanks to the support of Humanities Nebraska. We sincerely appreciate Humanities Nebraska's collaboration and the support of this talk and our programming in general. I also would like to thank our co-sponsors, UNO Religious Studies Department, UNO Political Science Department, UNO History Department, the Goldstein Center for Human Rights and International Studies. Uh, my colleague and uh, friend, Dr. Patrick McNamara will moderate q and a And he, he, he is a professor in the Department of Political Science and the Director of International Studies major at UNO. Before taking too much of your time, let me give you a piece of information about the Zoom webinar. Uh, I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with Zoom at this time after 14, 18 months of the pandemic. Uh, but if you have this, this is webinar, so it may be a little bit different than the one that you are familiar with. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please use the q and feature on the bottom. Uh, Dr. McNamara will actually look at those questions and uh, ask them, direct them to uh, Dr. Shahrani. You can also uh, do that during the talk as well. I mean, you don't have to wait until the end uh, because we, we will be collecting those questions. And if you have any general or technical questions, you can use the chat feature to reach us. Uh, for this particular event, we also partner with Center for Afghanistan Studies. And I would like to ask uh, Emily Hessenstab, the Director of International Programs at UNO, to welcome on behalf of the center and to introduce our speaker, Dr. Nazif El Shahrani. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I am Emily Hassenstab, Director of International Programs. I'm very pleased to be here today representing the Center for Afghanistan Studies during International Education Week and co-sponsoring this lecture. Um, the Center for Afghanistan Studies has been involved in Afghanistan and the region since 1972, meaning that we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary this coming spring. Uh, over these years, the center has trained more than 8,000 teachers in Afghanistan through our education and training programs. More recently, the center has worked with four major Afghanistan universities with funding provided through federal grants to help with their academic capacity building efforts and curriculum development programs. We've trained more than 700 Americans in our immersion seminar since 2008 and are planning to resume immersion seminar trainings this spring. The center has functioned as a research resources hub for researchers around the world. UNO's Afghanistan collection located at Chris Library holds more than 23,000 items on Afghanistan in the region. Annually, we offer events and activities for UNO students and the Omaha community. Every year we have a week of Central and South Asian activities on campus, also known as CASA Week. The center is deeply involved with the Afghan American community here in Nebraska and the Midwest. We are a source of analysis and commentary for various local, national, and international media outlets on Afghanistan and regional developments and affairs. Our director, Sherjan Ahmadzai, um, offers classes on geopolitics and national resources in the region. Additionally, we also facilitate online dialogues and discussions by experts on Afghanistan in the region, such as this. And through these activities, the center engages thousands across the globe each year. This week, as we celebrate International Education Week, I would like to highlight this lecture as the Charles Gildersleeve Know Your World Lecture. Charles Gildersleeve was one of the founding faculty members of the International Studies major at UNO. He was always available to help students with study abroad independent studies courses. 
His guest lecture each semester in the International Studies intro course was a highlight for all students. He took it upon himself to make international feel, students feel at home in class and on campus with his warm personality. And in memory of his contributions to international studies majors, major and to international students at UNO, International Programs presents the Charles Gildersleeve Know Your World Lecture each year during International Education Week. And now I would like to introduce our speaker, Nazif N. Shirani, Professor of Anthropology and Central Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Indiana University Bloomington. He specializes in political anthropology and anthropological approaches to the study of religion with a focus on Islam. Shirani is an Afghan American anthropologist with extensive field research in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkey, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. He held postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard and Stanford University, universities at the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars and the Smithsonian Institution. Some of his most recent publications are Modern Afghanistan, The Impact of 40 Years of War, and Revolutions and Rebellions in Afghanistan, Anthropological Perspectives. So welcome and thank you for being here. Um, good afternoon and salam alaikum to everyone. Uh, I couldn't remember all the co-sponsors of this event, but I do thank each and every one of them for inviting me and making it possible for me to be with you this afternoon. It really is a great pleasure and I'm sorry that uh, Dr. Ahmad Zay, whom I know I met actually in Tashkent um, this summer briefly, uh, is not here and I'm very glad that Dr. McNamara and also Dr. Hassan stopped for, for a very um, kind uh, introduction. And of course, Dr. Ramazan Kalinch, who has been in contact over the last uh, many weeks. Uh, and so many of you, I see on the screen at least 70, 71 having joined us. Um, I uh, appreciate your interest um, in Afghanistan and in me talking about Afghanistan. So let me share the screen with you a few slides that may help us um, essentially get things a little more under control. Um, the topic, of course, is one that uh, we negotiated, but mostly I think you chose that I should be talking about Islam and politics in Afghanistan before and after Taliban. But I really want to frame this much broader, if you would allow me. Uh, on Islam and politics, to some extent, even globally. Um, let me start with the dynamics of religion and politics in general. I'm going to be speaking about four different kinds of empires with very strong connections uh, to religion. Uh, before the European Renaissance Reformation and industrialization, the majority of empires or political institutions, political systems in the world for the longest time were empires of faith. That these are, these are fundamentally religion driven political entities. And here I'm going to show you on the map just briefly the Roman Empire, which is said to be uh, essentially a model for the current American Empire. The uh, Roman Empire by one of the American historians, Thomas Madden is referred to as the empire of trust. These were not empires that were based on conquest or invasions, but rather making friends and uh, acquiring essentially interest in territory through um, friendships, as it were. And also Roman Empire lasted about 700 years. So um, th uh, Thomas Madden essentially is saying that uh, American Empire, and I'll talk about that a little later, which is modeled after this, supposed to be also uh, doing better than the 700 years that the Romans did. 
you know, of course, Romans then later got uh, their empire divided into Eastern Byzantine and the Western Roman and so forth. Uh, the maps show basically the um, around 217. And then that was followed by another very large empire and that was Muslim empires that within a hundred and less than 150 years, it had all of this um, part of the world, a good part of the Roman empire plus, of course, was included in this empire of faith. Empires of faith essentially continued and particularly in the Muslim world by about the beginning of 16th, 16th century, 1500s, we had in the area that I'm concerned with, three major empires of faith that fought with each other, co competed with each other and so forth. In Iran, it was Safavid empire, which followed, was followed by Afsharid empire and then Qajar empire, which lasted until 1925, right after World War I. And then uh, uh, here, and, and for the South in, in Indian subcontinent, we had the Mughal Empire, uh, which of course lasted um, from about 1526 until the 1750s. And we'll talk about the fate in a minute. And then in the North, there was the uh, Shaibani, the Uzbek Empire, which turned into Khanates. All of them are religion based, all of them are driven by uh, some notion of uh, Islam and Sharia and so forth. If you see this little overlap here between the Mughals and the Safavids, they were fighting about this area constantly. And this is actually Kandahar, uh, the modern day sort of Taliban capital. They were even trying recently to turn it into the new capital of Afghanistan. It hasn't happened. But once these two empires fought each other in around 1747, and the Afshari king was killed or assassinated one night on his way from invading Mughal Empire, um, then he, one of his uh, guards, essentially, a, a military officer that belonged to the Pashtun ethnic group, and there were about 4,000 of them in the service of Afshar, Nadir Afshar, uh, he created his own empire from Kandahar, and that empire looked something like this. So parts of Iran, parts of Central Asia, parts of the uh, modern day Pakistan, Northern India, all of this. This was referred to as the Durrani Pashtun Empire that lasted from 1747 until 1826. And essentially, jihad was the motor for Ahmad Khan or Ahmad Shah. He made 14, uh, trips, war trips, that is, against India to invade India and, of course, to convert them supposedly to Islam. But the real motive was really Ghanima, that's loot, essentially, a lot of gold, a lot of um, uh, cash, and uh, that they took from uh, Indian subcontinent. And, of course, that was the base of political economy. He ruled about uh, 18, 19 years, but made 14 war trips against India for, again, justifying that is jihad and mobilizing it and so, and so forth. In much of these empires, I should say, Sharia norms essentially were taught through educational system that was decentralized and that was supported by people not by government. Governments really did very little. Uh, it was entirely, the Sharia was taught by local, um, in the local uh, mosques, in local madrasas, and it was free of charge. So anybody who wanted, in fact, this was one of the main driving force for up, uh, mo upper mob mobility for poor people. And uh, uh, Alim, uh, somebody who became a scholar through this free, educational system, they could travel anywhere in the Muslim world and across the uh, continents, in fact, and be employable and employed and so on and so forth. Dr. Shahrani, can you, I'm so sorry for interrupting. Can you maximize your slide? One of our guests was requesting that if possible. 
uh, how does that happen? The uh, through transition or um, maybe slideshow? Maybe at slideshow. Uh, just well, it didn't from current much, slide. Sorry. From current slide. I'm sorry. From current slide here. Just click there. Current it's slide. Second from left. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, there is. Perfect. Is that helpful? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. Good. I'm glad to uh, have been able to do that. What was also important in Muslim empires of faith was that deen and dawla, religion and state, religion or government, were viewed as twins, twin brothers, uh, particularly. And there is a lot of literature in the uh, 9th, 10th, 11th, uh, all the way to 12th century in um, uh, Muslim world, particularly things like um, uh, 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 Noma, Siyasat Noma, all of these books that were sort of a mirror for the prince before Machiavelli wrote his The Prince. In fact, Muslims had these mirrors showing how to govern, how to manage. And of course, Deen and Dawla were twins, viewed as twins. But the, the purpose was adala, justice, justice for, for, the, for the people. And both the kings and people were supposedly subject to the same law. And that was the Sharia law, the Quranic law, so that uh, rulers were not above the law, as it turned out in some, some other places uh, in, in the world. The ulama were also divided. There were some of them who were supporting the court policies. And there were many others who stood and spoke against them. And of course, we have lots and lots of stories of what happened to those who did speak uh, against uh, those kinds of things. The, how do we change now the slides? Any idea? Ah, there we go. It, 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 it worked. Okay. So what happened in European um, to these um, empires of faith. Empires of faith um, essentially came to a more or less an end, or, or um, particularly in Europe, and then from Europe also other empires of faith came to uh, be dismantled. The, the most important development in Europe was of course the 30 years religious wars from 1618 until 1648. And of course, what came into being from Renaissance Reformation Industrial Revolution was a new ideology of nationalism. And of course, also with uh, the Peace of Westphalia, the creation of modern nation states with, again, uh, supposedly uh, homogeneous ideologically, racially, um, uh, religiously, in, in every, every uh, possible uh, instance. And of course, in Europe, the consequence was also separation of church from state. Because until that, that time, in Europe, church had dominated everything, and people were uh, abused by the church, in fact, to a large extent. And that enabled Europeans to come into creating a new form of empire. Those are empires of commerce. Empires of commerce, in fact, are new, and they in, uh, dislodge empires of faith in places where they get to be common. And of course, much of this came with the um, development of these huge seagoing ships, which traversed the uh, Cape of uh, Good Hope and went a lot, you know, across uh, uh, Atlantic to discover so-called discover America. America already was populated and uh, had been discovered a long time earlier, but Europeans at least rediscovered it and, and colonized and created uh, their empires of um, uh, commerce. The empires of commerce, once Europeans got their foot in these areas and developed interest and invested money and made money, then the next form of empire came into being, and that is empires by conquest. 
So if you had a territory, commercial territory, you had to save it. And that's what happened with uh, Tsarist Russia. This whole black area initially was conquered or, or taken by um, commerce and then followed by uh, armies that stabilized them and so forth. And the rest, Australia, India, much of Africa and so forth by Britain and Europeans got other ones and Asia of course got its uh, share of uh, colonies by Europeans. And if you look here, Afghanistan is right here, uh, is part of that, not part of colony, but part that is affected seriously by colony and that's where we will go. And of course, eventually uh, these empires of conquest were challenged after World War I and of course through World War II and post-World War II and that's when we have these wars of liberation. And wars of liberation in the Muslim countries essentially mobilizes, uh, gets mobilized through jihad. Jihad is no longer a concept in Islam for expanding its uh, territory, for going out and getting loot, but rather defending its territory. Islam in danger becomes a cry. And that's what um, uh, a lot of countries Muslim countries anyway, go through uh, in their struggle against the empires of conquest that, and colonialism that, that the West had brought uh, uh, about. So here, I want to just return briefly to this something called the great game. The great game was of course fought between the Tsarist Russian empire coming from the North and British India coming, now it had occupied, uh, it had conquered, uh, as this uh, previous slide showed, much of the Mughal Empire. And of course, this is what they managed to create as a buffer state. The British particularly were uh, concerned because in the 1880, 1860s, Russians came down and took much of Central Asia, the Khanats of Khiva, Bukhara, and Khokhan, and the British were concerned that they were going to come down south uh, in search of warm waters and of course their uh, holdings in, in uh, India would be endangered. So that they created this buffer state. And if you want to know why this little finger where I spent two years of my life doing actually my initial doctoral anthropological research became part of Afghanistan is because British India did not want to have common border with uh, Russia at that time. And they literally bribed the King of Afghanistan about whom I'll talk shortly uh, to accept this for extra money uh, that they were uh, subsidizing him annually. So uh, this buffer state cre gets created during second Anglo-Afghan war in 1880. And I'll get to that. But if anybody is interested in reading a good book, a recent book, that came out in 2018 on Afghanistan. It's this one by Jonathan Lee, Afghanistan a History from 12, uh, 1216 to the present, present being 2017. It is one of the best critical histories that I have seen um, written about Afghanistan, critical not only British history uh, writers, but also the Afghan, to, to some extent, uh, Afghans who have written about their own country. It's a very important book. And I've done a review of that actually published in Central Asian Survey. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to share that. Um, so what happens uh, in 1880 in Afghanistan is uh, this notion of nationalism actually gets into Afghanistan. And part of the reason why that happened was this guy, Abdurrahman Khan, had been, Afghanistan after 1826 was in a war of succession, essentially between brothers, between um, uh, uncles and cousins and whatnot. And he was also, his father was um, briefly king uh, and fighting his brothers, but eventually he sort of in 19, 1870, uh, runs away and goes to Samarkand and spends 10 years in Samarkand and learns about Russian politics and Russian uh, policies and so forth. And lo and behold, 
his hero becomes Peter the Great. So he models himself essentially after Peter the Great. In 1879, when the British invades Afghanistan, they are looking for somebody and they essentially invite him coming down from uh, Samarkand to Kabul. And he is literally crowned by a British general in August of 1880 is the Amir uh, Abdurrahman or Amir of Afghanistan. And later, of course, uh, what they do is they give him a lot of money and a lot of weapons and they let him loose and essentially give him, well, we control the foreign policy, you do what you want with the country. And what he does, the first thing that he does is he nationalizes Islam. It's probably one of the earliest Muslim leaders who nationalizes Islam. Islam is not just a world religion, now it is a religion of a, a particular country in that country be to, to, to uh, be Afghanistan. And of course, jihad, the concept also now has a new form, a new meaning and new use. And that new use is that it's going to be used to mobilize people against foreigners as well as domestic enemies. And his domestic enemies he imagined were quite a few. And one of the, and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, one of the other things in this part of nationalization he did was nationalize Awqaf, the religious endowments that supported a lot of public service and a lot of other things. Abdurrahman essentially nationalized those and claimed those as part of state. And of course, particularly he got in control of Islamic education. Madaris were no longer, um, uh, private, uh, popularly supported. They became uh, registered and, and uh, tests and examinations were introduced. Uh, courts were also uh, created and courts became essentially his means through which he centralized the country. And, and of course the country that had been created for him was not uniform ethnically. But in fact, all of these colors that you see in the map here are showing diversity of ethnic groups. The purple ones are Tajiks uh, in uh, Russian side, as well as in the Afghan side, the brown ones are Uzbeks, and this little sliver of white that they purposefully kept within Afghanistan or Turkomans. And then here you find the Khorasani Persians uh, that with Iranian uh, thing. And if you have this, this blue area or Baluch, so they're divided between Iran in British India, in Afghanistan. And then of course, what they did and they terribly uh, by themselves alone, none of these borders were in fact negotiated by Afghans. All of them were negotiated by British India with Russia or with Iran or purposefully here themselves. This is called the Duran line which divides the Pashtuns into two halves and keep the better half essentially within British India and then the poorer marginal areas inhabited by Pashtuns and give it to the Afghans. Pashtun and Afghan are synonymous in Afghanistan. They mean the same thing. So that this guy uh, uses the money and the weapons uh, from uh, uh, British and uh, makes himself uh, uh, essentially the toughest ruler in the history of Afghanistan that the British themselves then came to call him the Iron Amir because he was using sword essentially to um, impose himself on the people. And I'll, I'll come back to that as well, but um, the European nationalism and nationalist ideas of course spread. And then we know what happened to the Ottoman empire uh, right after World War I. Uh, all of these maps and what, what uh, uh, Central Asia, I mean, Middle Eastern countries uh, looked like in terms of ethnic makeup. And all of this was essentially done uh, by the colonial powers who came and in, in fought in the area. <clears throat> what uh, is important to remember, uh, maybe I should go back to uh, that slide, uh, no. I, I wanted to uh, emphasize the fact uh, that Islam uh, in, this kind of, in, in his ima imagination 
uh, was also, um, or nationalism, I'm sorry, nationalism meant one country, one leader, one language, one religion. When in his case, he meant really sectarianism, sect. So he wanted to essentially homogenize this entire country in the image of his own Pashtun tribe that the British had empowered him as, as a ruler. So that he wanted to turn Pashtu as a language into a national language, his Sunni Hanafi school into the national uh, religion. So against Shias, whether Ismailis or uh, Jafaris who lived in Afghanistan in large numbers, um, they were the, essentially declared as Kafirs, as non-believers and fought and destroyed in central Afghanistan. And these were Hazaras. Uh, and some other uh, ethnic groups who were also Shias. And of course, the last bastion of non-Muslims, Kafirs in, in the Northeastern Afghanistan, which came to be Nuristan, was also part of this nationalization scheme that um, Amir Abdurrahman had uh, brought about. Um, I wanted to uh, touch base on um, what happens uh, in the later, period that is monarchy in Afghanistan essentially support was supported by British uh, through uh, the life of Amir Abdurrahman which ended in 1901 and he was the only ruler of Afghanistan who died peacefully in his own bed but they could not bury him in the public cemetery because people were threatening to dig up his body and feed it to the dogs because of what he had done to his own people. So uh, his son was also supported by the British. And then in 1919, um, uh, Abdurrahman's grandson declared independence. He lost the subsidies that the uh, European, I mean, British had been given to his father and grandfather. And he only lasted nine years in office and he was driven out uh, essentially in someone who replaced him uh, lasted only nine months because no one recognized, no one gave him a penny or anything. In 1929, it, once again, um, a new ruler was introduced by the British Indians, uh, Nader Khan, who was an ambassador in, in France and was brought with his four brothers and so forth and given money and given weapons. So the point is, Afghanistan has never had a legitimate, popular, uh, government. People have had no choice in what government they had. Their governments were always rented regimes, not rentier, but rented, literally, that uh, they were put into place in power by outsiders to work for the protection of interests of the outsiders, not their own people, not, not the country is such. And of course, this is what uh, continued through the Cold War. And of course, what, what the country faced was during the Cold War, the country got uh, help both from the communists as well as from the capitalists, from the West as well as the East at the time. And again, uh, becoming a rented regime, but here at least there was a little bit of competition between two sides in which the um, governments that were uh, monarchy that, that was in the middle uh, had some benefits, but that ended with Soviet invasion. Soviet invasion literally is not only the beginning of Cold War, but uh, I, I'm sorry, not the beginning of Cold War, but one of the very important events in the Cold War that uh, the West essentially uh, uh, distorted Afghanistan's own war of liberation against communism and against Soviet invasion and so forth and turned it into a proxy war. Uh, and a proxy war that uh, brought about something very significant about the notion of jihad. Jihad was not local, not local or national phenomena anymore. It became a globalized phenomenon where you, uh, you know, I mean, United States CIA and others uh, contributed in recruiting a lot of 
uh, people from the United States, Europe, Middle East, and so forth, some 30,000 so-called Arab Afghans were introduced in Afghanistan. And this is something, there is a misconception uh, that we have held on, that this was CIA's work. It wasn't, apparently. There is a very important book by Count de Menarche and David Edelman. It's called The Fourth World War. The Fourth World War. And of course, uh, and of, uh, he also adds an espionage in the age of uh, terrorism. Who was Count de Menarche? He was the head of intelligence in France in the 1970s through 1981. He, uh, his book starts with a very interesting story that he meets with uh, President-elect Reagan. And Reagan asked him, what does he need to do? Afghanistan had been just invaded by Russians, by Soviets. He said, you need to focus on Afghanistan. He says, what should I do in Afghanistan? He says two things. First, you focus on religion, and second, on drugs. The religion party said, in France, there is a small cell that translates Bibles into Russian. They don't have enough money. We need some money so that they can produce more Bibles in translation and send it to the soldiers in Afghanistan so that they can take it to Russia. And secondly, we need money to create madrasas, lots of them and teach them particular kinds of Islam that is anti-Soviet uh, and anti this and that. And that's why uh, the American money, but the, the plan, the project is a French one. And that French essentially, he says for 11 years, he uh, did this secretly with uh, CIA money. And now we have 45,000. 45,000 registered madrasas in Pakistan, and they have produced Taliban, and they're tr producing more of them in, in that area. The second thing that, that was critical, he said, what do you do with all the drugs that uh, FBI captures? He said, well, we burn them. He says, don't burn them. Give it to me, and I will take it to the front, and we'll give it free, freely to the enemy soldiers. And also we need to produce more drugs in the, in the place. And of course, that's what makes Afghanistan, in, as you can see in the map, uh, producer of opium. And opium becomes essentially in drug production and, and all, the, all the other things that goes with it is part of that. And of course, with that, the consequence is Islamophobia, global Islamophobia. And, and that, all, of course, is supported by organizations such as Al-Qaeda, Taliban, Daesh, and so forth. So that the US and NATO war of the last 20 years in Afghanistan is part and parcel of, uh, initially, uh, the, I, I should say 1980s war was part of the Cold War. The uh, last 20 years war, according to uh, Count Menarche is the Fourth World War. The Fourth World War is essentially fought by developed countries against underdeveloped countries, the Third World, that they have to be essentially kept poor, kept at war, and the West versus the rest essentially is the reason why these wars are going on, and religion has become essentially one of the key ingredients for promotion of these war, for fighting these war. And of course, these wars are also uh, proxy wars. And proxy wars that uh, has been created between Iran and Saudi Arabia in this map, you can see how many of them are going on between the two countries and these are pro proxy confl conflicts that are promoted by others. And of course here in this uh, map, you can also see what the focus is, oil, gas, petroleum, um, crude oil, oil, and so forth. So much of this, uh, these are resources. These are resources in, in the Muslim lands that are essentially targeted by various means 
uh, through ideologies of nationalism, and then of course, creation of nationalization of religion, nationalization of um, sectarianism. You can see now, we don't have just Islam, we have Iranian Islam, we have Turkish Islam, we have Libyan Islam, we have Egyptian Islam, we have Afghan Islam, and there are Islams of all, all kinds, all, every imagination uh, that you could have. And of course, these are the ones that, that are essentially uh, brought the, the region into the condition that we find it today. What is very important uh, uh, is the last slide that I want to sort of bring out is how Taliban have weaponized Sharia. And within the Sharia, they are focusing on something that are referred to as Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi an al Munkar in Arabic. It's a Quranic um, uh, verse. It essentially translates loosely into promotion of virtues and prohibition of the vices. But what, how is that essentially translated into policy for Taliban and what the implications of that are for uh, politics in Islam and also uh, state society, West, East-West relations and all the rest. Uh, one of the important things that, that it has brought about is um, instrumentalization of the so-called hudud laws in Islam. These are some rules that are very, very rarely used. And they, there are very strict conditions within Sharia on the use of these things, but Taliban essentially are making use of them uh, uh, in, in very liberal fashion and against the enemies and against those who that, um, are opposed to them. And the whole idea is really also being anti-liberal, anti-modern, anti-West, if you can, if you can uh, sort of call it into that, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, what are these things? Uh, two very important uh, things that they have used liberally is um, chopping people's so-called thieves, limbs, hands and legs of people who have been caught stealing. Under Taliban conditions, both in the 1990s and now, now of course is 60% of the people are starving right now in Afghanistan after three months of their rule. And earlier also the conditions were horrible. So Islam never allows chopping of any uh, person's hands or limbs under these conditions. That it's possible only if the uh, state has provided for the basic needs of human um, um, community within their control. And if somebody does it, then does it because of uh, some other motives. And, and uh, under those circumstances, it's possible, but not under the circumstances that uh, they were using. So this was really an excuse for control, an excuse for getting people that uh, they thought were opposed to them and so forth. The other thing was fornication, which is really their stance against women and women's rights and women's everything. Uh, we know uh, Quranic rules and Sharia rules are saying that for anyone to be stoned because of illegitimate sexual relations, there has to be four witnesses, a actual and, and witnesses actually observing the, the act of sexual penetration, which is absolutely impossible in that it has not been done. Whenever it has been done, it has been done is a, is a, uh, essentially um, for political reasons, for oppression against women, for gender issues and nothing uh, other than that. And that they have in fact executed adulterers publicly. And um, uh, even now they have been uh, uh, hanging people uh, from um, the back of trucks with and hanging them and then parading them essentially through streets and so forth in very inhumane and undignified fashion, which is part of what they call is um, their, their um, uh, Amribil Maruf Nayan al Munka. The other uh, issue, of course, is gender apartheid, that women were 
totally excluded and they are now partially, they, are, they have supposedly uh, loosened that a little bit, but there are still girls between uh, age, uh, grades of uh, seven through 12 that are not allowed to go to school and uh, college uh, students are also not allowed to, to go to classes because of fixed gender and you're working on that. So uh, in essence, they are essentially denying women their human rights and their gender rights and the Quran allows. There is nothing in the spirit of the Quran that anybody could, uh, could interpret the way they, they do, but they are. They, have, they uh, were banning music, in fact, doing all kinds of things to musical uh, discs and uh, tapes and so on and so forth earlier on. And uh, one of the other things that they have been doing is uh, those that they suspect are not supporting them. They call them Fasiq, Fajr, and Kafir, essentially dehumanizing them and telling them they're not good Muslims or they're Kafirs, they're, they're essentially non-believers. So once you reach that, then the killing becomes permissible. And that's what they do. And, and they have their um, uh, uh, young people. I've heard recently a young boy, 15 years of age, was asked, uh, when did you join the Taliban jihadi group? He said, when I was 13. He says, what do you want in life? He says, well, I want uh, to, to be shaheed, to be martyred. He says, why do you want to be uh, uh, martyred? He says, because uh, I'm told that before my blood, when I'm killed, reaches the ground, I will be accepted in the heaven. And in the heaven, 72 um, beautiful women will be waiting for me. And that I can also intervene for 70 relatives who may not be uh, eligible to be forgiven to go to heaven that I could become their vehicle for going to heaven. So this is the kind of Islam, it's, it's almost like a shop. God has been turned into a shopkeeper for these people to, to, to give them these pleasures in the next life. And it has nothing to do with uh, norms, with ethical conduct, with uh, pl pleasing God, which is essentially what Islam is all about, that you do things for the pleasure of God and, and, and uh, God's pleasure is always to please your human kind, your, your brothers and those who, who are of, uh, your, your um, members of your society. And of course, the other aspect of it is um, essentially policing piety, that how long should be a beard, what kind of uh, clothing you should be wear, uh, you should have turban, you should have, you know, the, the kind of things that they wear and the kinds of things that they present themselves is, is a good uh, supposed Muslim and that they're forcing people to go to a mosque at prayer times and so on. Again, this is prohibited in the Quran that there is no compulsion in religion is, is a verse in the Quran that's explicitly so, but they are engaging on, on those. They are also against elections against um, human rights, against a whole lot of things, and particularly gender uh, apartheid and uh, abuse of human uh, rights. And this is again, uh, based entirely on their very limited, very abusive, very uh, problematic reading of the Quran and construction of the Sharia. And that's indeed what, what uh, the problem has become. Uh, that stayed in society in Afghanistan under Taliban um, uh, in, in uh, the use or abuse, I should say, instrumental abuse of religion has reached a point that uh, uh, the history of Afghanistan has, ne has never seen. Although uh, religion has been instrumentalized and abused throughout the history of Afghanistan and a lot of other um, countries as well, but never in the extent of the last 26 years of the presence of Taliban in Afghanistan in, of course, their rule in the last three months. And they are the greatest threat the Afghan society has faced. They are claiming these days that they are not threat to any other country. 
That may be true, but they are the greatest threat to the Afghans and Afghan society itself because of the way that they are constructing um, Sharia and their notion and understanding of Quran. Uh, well, Quran, they never refer to. They, they call Sharia, you know, I, I'm not sure what in that 45,000 um, madrasas that the French uh, constructed for them with the US money is being taught. We know what's being taught is not related to the Quran. If it were, this would not happen. So let me just stop there. And uh, I know there's a lot that I have uh, suggested here and I'd be happy to, uh, to um, ask, answer any questions and comments in the remainder of our time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahrani, for giving this historical and political overview of uh, the situation. Uh, now uh, we will have a Q&A session and we will answer some of the questions that we had. Uh, is Dr. McNamara here? Or maybe he was at the airport, but <laughs> if not, I can, yeah, I can go ahead and uh, moderate uh, the Q&A. We have had a few questions. Uh, uh, one of them uh, was, well, he's here. Ah, here okay. is uh, Dr. McNamara. Okay. Your, your uh, microphone is closed. Okay. Hi, Patrick. Yes, I was just, I, I thought you're playing. Yeah, you're, I, you're bad, I apologize. I'm in the... That's I'm fine. in the airport right now on my way to Tajikistan. And wow. so this, this is such a relevant and interesting topic. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sharani. I appreciate uh, all that you've, you've shared with us. Um, we have some questions in the, in the Q&A and I would invite anyone else to put their questions there. Uh, first coming from my friend and colleague Tej Adidam, is it fair to state that Islamic conquests were primarily driven by loot rather than by conversions? Uh, this is uh, very true um, when Islamic marauders invaded India multiple times, as per your comments. Uh, right. Please elaborate. Thank you. Yes, I, I think in the case of India, there were two major um, rulers who indulged um, in essentially attacking India, uh, justifying it on the basis of um, expanding Islamic territory and converting people. And of course that, that may have been one of the reasons, but what made it possible was the attraction of ghanima, which means essentially loot. Anything that you can, you can capture, you can have, you can take home and it's yours. And I think it was also a lot of the time seasonal that these wars were during the winter when people's uh, you know, the uh, crops were already harvested and they were basically sitting around in the cold and they were now going uh, you know, as part of Lashkar to India. It was, the weather was warmer and so forth. And of course, if you're lucky and you, you took some territory, you'll come home with lots of um, money. I don't think uh, it's, uh, it can be entirely uh, just loot or entirely, certainly it was not just merit of, you know, um, bringing essentially uh, converts to, to the community. So it, it was always mixed. It was always, that's, that's what happens, I think, with, um, uh, you know, uh, mixing religion and politics. And religion and politics and its, its machinations are not unique to Islam. Um, it, has, it has happened in, in Buddhist kingdoms. You go to um, uh, say Thailand or, or Nepal or you know, any of the uh, other ones or even uh, Indonesia before Islam uh, or China or, or Shinto um, uh, Japan. And of course, uh, Christian Europe. Um, we have lots of cases like that, which is not very different. It's just, again, you, we're humans and uh, our motivations can be mixed up. We can justify a lot of things on the basis of deceit 
and um, yeah, something that goes on even even uh, right now, you know, the 2019 um, uh, Afghanistan papers in Washington Post um, is telling us that our government is deceiving us. It's based on deceptions. Not they are lying. They are not telling the truth. And I don't think this was any different in the earlier period, especially when uh, religion was the dominant motivating force for politicians to carry out their particular plans uh, in whatever context. Thank you. Um, another question about the uh, Hazara people, the, the Shia minority that mm -hmm. you talked about before. Um, can you talk more about the genocide of both uh, the Hazara and the Zoroastrians? Well, I'm not uh, aware of the Zoroastrians uh, massacres. I mean, it, if it happened, it happened at the early stages when Islam was being introduced and we don't have a lot of documentations of that. But the Hazara episode in the 19, uh, 1890s in uh, Hazarajat is well documented. There's plenty of um, uh, both oral history as well as written records of those who witnessed it. Um, the problem with Abdurrahman was that he was a little um, uh, suspicious of virtually everybody who, who was not even amongst his own kinsmen. And one of his, his first um, wars was against the Ghilzai. He was a Durrani. He was from um, the Kandahar area. We have the same problem right now between uh, Pashtun Taliban. The same thing is being played out. Uh, there is, um, uh, right now, there are three factions amongst the Taliban. The, uh, there is Mullah Bradar in his group who have negotiated in Doha with Americans and with others. They're supposedly the more tolerant and the more accepting and the more this, that. And then there is Mullah Yaqub in Mullah Zakir. Uh, these are also Kandaharis, but Yaqub is Mullah Omar's son. And uh, Yaqub is also Minister of Defense in the, in the current government. So he doesn't, uh, he believes, he believes that they are the victors and anybody who is victor, victorious, and they give even the you know, American political system, look, when Republicans win, the election or, or um, you know, Democrats win, what happens? They appoint all of their own and blah, blah. So we have won, now we are entitled to um, do as we wish. We're, we don't want to get anybody uh, to share power with us is Mala brother wants. And then the third one is Haqqani group who are Ghilzais. They are from different tribe. They're Eastern Pashtuns. And Eastern Pashtuns and Western Pashtuns, the Kandahari Pashtuns and Ningarhar Pashtuns, Patia and Paktika Pashtuns, they have their, their own struggles amongst them. So this goes back to Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman fought the Ghilzais, massacred them in very large numbers. And then uh, after they pacified and they also were shipped out to, to Northern Afghanistan, a lot of Pashtuns um, who have been there more than a century now, because of forced uh, relocation. And these were Ghilzai Pashtuns who were sent by Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman also sent some of his own things because he wanted to reward them with land and pasture and so on and so forth. So there are some Kandaharis there as well. So you have this. And then after that, he turned to um, uh, Hazaras. Hazaras occupied central Afghanistan. They were also like Pashtuns tribally organized in those days. And they were powerful. They, 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 they were in mountainous area. They could defend themselves and all the rest. So uh, Abdurrahman was not going to tolerate that. He wanted that one country with one leader, one language, one this, one that. And he, in fact, came up with this uh, metaphor of, I am building a house. And if you build a house, you need to essentially remove all the vermins from the house. So 
all anybody who that he suspected could be opposing him were vermins, and they they were they had to be cleaned and cleared out. So they he turned against the Hazaras, and the stories are are gory, uh, in terms of you know what he did. There are stories that are, that are told today amongst Hazaras that in one instance he used to cut the heads, and then put them on hot tin so that they would dance and he would enjoy watching the dancing of the cut head on top of a, a, a tin plate, heated tin plate. The other one is that he uh, used to shave the heads of young warriors and then put a rim of dough around their skull in poor boiling oil on top of their skulls uh, uh, with a rim holding. So much of it, skinning people alive, uh, all kinds of other, you know, putting people on uh, cages, iron cages and hanging them by, this, by the roadside without giving them water and food and so forth so that they die and, you know, people sort of walk by and see what happens. So these are the kinds of, you know, horrible torture forms that the Hazaras would subjected. One important thing that you have to remember, of course, is Hazaras were the only, the only ethnic group that were entirely contained within the uh, buffer state that the British designed. They were right in the center of Afghanistan. What happened? The other ones were divided. The Pashtuns are divided, Tajiks, Uzbeks, Turkmen, all of them were divided, the Baluch. So what happened? Half a million Hazaras run away from the country to Mashhad in Iran and Quetta in Pakistan. They're still there. So the only ethnic group that, that was within the country also got um, you know, um, uh, sent out essentially to other countries. And, and fast forward to today, they, they, they still are targeted. Uh... They still are, they still are targeted. Um, they, I mean, they themselves, of course, killed a lot of Hazaras and targeted Hazaras before they took power. And now they are blaming the Daesh, that they, the Daesh were doing it. But what was done by themselves is forgotten. And now, of course, they're saying, no, this is wrong and Daesh uh, shouldn't do this. And that's why Iranians are also siding with them. And the Daesh has become an excuse, um, I think, um, for them to argue both with Americans, with Western Europeans, with Iranians um, and others that um, they are anti-Daesh, therefore uh, they should be forgiven and all of their crimes forgotten. And that of course is, is not uh, acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I see in, in the chat that uh, Yasir Malikzada was um, clarifying what, what, what he meant by that, by that earlier question. I want to go to a second question. I'm actually going to combine a couple of questions here. Uh, James Knowles asks about the um, ideology that was started in the French madrasas. Uh, mm -hmm. How did that switch from being anti-Soviet to anti-Western? in the madrasa education. Well, you and know, my, 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 my friend Hanif, uh, uh, who's working at the Center for Afghanistan Studies, also asks about the, um, who do you think is uh, funding the madrasas today? So both, how did things swing uh, to the focus um, to the anti-West, as well as, uh, you know, what, what should be done uh, about what's going on in Madras. The anti-West anti part is not very difficult because we invited, say, um, Bin Laden and company, including uh, Zawahiri and the, the Palestinian uh, Azam, um, who were all invited by CIA, funded by CIA, and um, uh, were involved in uh, probably some of those textbooks that uh, uh, your university uh, also was responsible in uh, producing them. And, uh, you know, if you shoot uh, a bullet in such a speed, you know, and before it hits um, Russian 
a body or tank or whatever, uh, you know, um, in the distances, blah, blah, just calculate, you know, that, uh, I don't know, speed or something. I mean, mathematics was full of, full of this kind of uh, stuff. Um, and many other things were basically uh, turned into a hateful um, rhetoric against the enemy. At that point, it made a lot of sense. And guess what happened? In uh, 89, Russians left. And so did um, al-Zawahiri and uh, bin Laden. They went home. And then what happened? Kuwait was invaded by the United States of America. Uh, uh, well, I mean, um, Saddam did it, but the uh, US went to essentially um, um, respond to that horrible thing that Saddam had done. And it was not very difficult for uh, bin Laden to, in fact, apparently argue to the king of Saudi Arabia that don't allow the West and the Americans to come here and invade our country. I'm going to mobilize jihadis and we will go and take care of Saddam. And there, of course, was the, the response was, you, you're nuts. And they threw the bomb out. So the bomb went to uh, Yemen first and then ended up in Sudan. You see, the argument, the logic is so simple. If you are encouraged to resist Russians in Afghanistan, why should you not resist Americans in Saudi Arabia or in, in Iraq? It was that simple. And I think people just could, could you know, reason that um, if you are against um, one infidel in one Western whatever, you can, if the other ones harm you, you, you should be also the same You do the same. So the, the ideology of uh, extremism uh, was constructed around this very simple issue. If one is evil, the other one can be evil as well. Why not? And that's what they're playing with. And that's what they are, they are actually uh, thriving on. On the question of um, yeah. funding. The funding, the, the funding and, and, and modern day, like, like now. And modern day, that's what, I, what I'm saying. I think uh, Western countries are still involved. You remember one thing about the 1980s, that there was an arrangement between the US, the CIA and Saudi Arabia, uh, sharing dollar for dollar. Every dollar that Americans spent in the war in the 1980s in Afghanistan, Saudis matched it, dollar for dollar. And the estimates are around $10 billion, so five each contributed. I have a feeling that, that that funding is probably continued by um, the Gulf states. Saudi certainly, whether you know, uh, Mohammed Salman is doing it now or not, is hard to tell. But I think they, there, are, uh, there are means. Also, um, the I idea of production of narcotics and uh, also mining a lot of the um, you know uh, materials inside Afghanistan that are being shipped to Pakistan and others. Uh, I think uh, Pakistanis themselves are also probably thriving in, in supporting these um, uh, entities because it's part of their support, supposedly security apparatus against India and maybe uh, also in favor of controlling Afghanistan. So I, I don't think the funding is, is um, something that uh, uh, would be hard to imagine would discontinue, especially since it has paid off so well. Yeah, yeah. Islamophobia is you know, one of those things that these, these guys have produced, so why not keep it up?
And let, let me stick on that point of Islamophobia and ask about um, what one uh, questioner, uh, Francisco, asks. Um, how has the West's disapproval and occasional Islamic phobic stances helped increase the acceptance of more radical forms of Islam there in Afghanistan? Well, I, you know, America is, um, uh, is not very reflective and reflexive of its own um, doings. We have very short memory. Um, historically, we're not very conscious of, you know, um, our own deeds, uh, long term, short term, every everywhere. Uh, the problem, I think, is uh, America in 1990, I'm sorry, 2002, when I first went to, back to Afghanistan, had an incredible, incredible um, goodwill on the part of Afghans virtually everywhere. Everybody thought America had come this time to do the right thing. That is put a good government together, do this, do that. Now, of course, what we did was instead of, we, we threw the, the bombs out, the, the Taliban, very short, you know, two months, uh, two, three months with two, 300, soldiers on the ground. The job was done. So what was the point of sending more soldiers, more soldiers, more soldiers, and then chasing, um, you know, Al-Qaeda or Taliban or whatever, through huge number of soldiers? There was no point in any of that. And why we did that, I think, has to do with military industrial complex. That was its work. We need to be at war. That's, that's what fourth, fourth World War that De Marche is talking about, all about. That we need to, we, you know, Eisenhower was absolutely right. Anybody who hasn't, you know, heard his uh, farewell speech ought to be hearing it. That's where he coined that term, military industrial complex, and warned the country that we need to wean ourselves. We didn't. And he said, we're going to be at war all the time. If we didn't, we are at war all the time now. We're selling the largest amount of uh, weapons. Uh, we're doing all, all the things that we shouldn't be doing. And, and what happened, of course, was that American policies essentially uh, destroyed that goodwill in Afghanistan. Today, in Afghanistan, you don't find people, anybody, anyone, really, literally anyone, who would uh, think America is doing anything good. And of course, they do not necessarily support extremism, but, but if they think somebody is doing something against America, they certainly would not blink. You mentioned let that, them do it. You mentioned that 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 sixty percent of the people in Afghanistan today are starving. Yes. Um, I, I'm going to combine a, a question about that with a question from actually one of my uh, star students, uh, Mohammed. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, what can be done to solve that issue of uh, starvation, of, 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 of famine? But, but, but I guess in a broader sense, um, what is the solution to improve Afghanistan today? Given the reality, what is the, uh, the solution today? Yeah. Uh, well, the challenge I think uh, that the uh, international community is facing is that they have allowed, and the United States and NATO is to be blamed for that, uh, a, a, a terrorist group to declare itself as a victor and assume the powers of state. That's the reality. We, uh, it, in one end, we have accepted, yeah, well, this is, this is the situation. In uh, other way, we are saying, no, we're not going to recognize them because they are still not uh, obeying, you know, some of their agreements. They have not uh, um, done what they had promised they would do, like a broad-based government, you know, and um, without defining what that broad base is and all the rest. Uh, so they are in a situation where they have to deal with the Taliban. But dealing with the Taliban shouldn't be recognition of Taliban or strengthening of the Taliban regime. I think they have options <coughs> they're not exploring or they have not yet. And that is 
it's possible to help people of Afghanistan through international entities. They can negotiate with Taliban to allow United Nations or Islamic organization um, uh, or um, Red Cross, all these um, you know, uh, non-governmental NGO um, you know, entities that had worked there for a long time, that they have networks, they have possibilities, they have capabilities, that they should be the ones to, to be allowed to provide services to the country uh, as people. Because uh, Taliban are not governing body. They are a war machine. Their entire, in the last three months, all they have cared about is creating their military, renaming bases, renaming this, and uh, you know, uh, re-equipping, and uh, in some cases, at least giving them new uniforms and things like that. Their, their entire interest is in the military, nothing else. They're not providing anything. And if they have provided any help, small amounts of help that has come uh, from China, I think $1 million and maybe uh, Turkey and Pakistan and um, Qatar and these guys, all of that has been given to the Taliban. The Taliban, their own Taliban. And they have been also holding these um, uh, ceremonies, giving golden watches to the father of the, uh, the suicide bombers. I mean, this is one of their, their biggest achievement now. And they're literally day in, day out, talk about being their, their victors against the United States. They defeated the United States. They defeated um, NATO. They defeated this. And this is what gives, I think, this uh, feeling to Daesh and all other things. If they could do it, why couldn't we do it? So they have become a role model for extremists. And that's the reality that we're faced with. And I think, um, you know, uh, we need to understand that and we need to deal with it. Af people of Afghanistan really need help and they could be helped, but they have to be helped through third parties. And the Taliban oh, their, their government. To be allowed to be allowed to let them do it. Yeah. Their government really isn't it, it isn't doing what what needs. I mean, governance. Uh, let, let me ask you the the interests of Russia. We get another question about uh, how is Russia involved with the Taliban today. They are scared stiff of um, what how Taliban could be used against them and against China. I think both China and Russia's uh, um, interest in Taliban is out of fear that they want to uh, appease them in a way that the threat could not be posed from their area of control against them. And the reason for that is they understand this perfectly well. They were, they were babbling about the fact that America is uh, in Afghanistan and uh, it's a threat to them and so on and so forth. It was all bull. Um, you remember, before the United States intervened, Russia had 25,000 soldiers on Tajikistan's border where you had it in 1990s. And in fact, 2000, 2000, 2001. And what happened? As soon as America went there, they pulled their, their soldiers out. Because when America was in Afghanistan, America could not be a threat against Russia or against China next door. That would be just too damn obvious. And they knew that. But in Iran, the same. There was nothing done against Iran from Afghanistan by the United States, nothing done in the 20 years against Russia or against China. Now that we are out of there, we have the liberty of doing anything we want against them. And they know that. And Taliban regime is an ideal model because it's a terrorist regime and we don't recognize them. We have assets there. We were there for 20 years, for God's sake. We have lots of assets. 
and we could use them. And we could use them to destabilize Central Asia. And we could also prevent the one built one road. That's the, that's the biggest thing that China is fearing. And Russia is fearing also destabilization and more drug running and more a lot of things up north that they have to be fearful of. So that's what the reality on the ground is. That's what the Chinese and the and, um, American, I mean, Russian and Iranian fear is that they want to appease the Taliban and see if they could work with them so that um, they would be uh, not allowing, um, you know, these kinds of things that could be done in, in, in the area. But given how things are going, you know, we had two explosions today in Kabul and two more yesterday and, and goes on. And they're all blaming it to Daesh. It's not all Daesh. It's, it's all kinds of, there's, there's also national resistance growing. Uh, there are reports in just north of Kabul in the Shamali Plain and Jabal Saraj, they, the uh, uh, national resistance killed 11 Taliban last night. And that's going to grow and that's going to expand. Uh, so that I think Russians and Chinese have plenty to worry about, but they seem to think that they can bank on Taliban to uh, avoid that. I'd say good luck. We have at UNO uh, Insight, which is um, one of the the uh, Department of Homeland Security's um, centers of excellence, and um, we're doing a lot on uh, domestic terrorism. One, my friend Bob Holbert from our Center for Afghanistan Studies asks, can you comment on the similarities and differences between the Taliban and American domestic terrorists? Hmm. Uh, well, Taliban, I think one similarity uh, would, or uh, this similarity, I suppose, is that the Taliban are claiming to be nationalists, that they are essentially binding themselves within the bounds of um, the geography of Afghanistan. But the strange thing is, they have been um, working with international terrorists who have helped them do their claims. They have had Uyghurs, they have had Uzbek, IMU, they have had Tajik uh, resistance. You know, these are all international and they have had Al-Qaeda. Uh, so the claim of being nationalist and being uh, essentially homebound and posing no threat to anybody outside the uh, borders of the country is all, I think, nonsense. Um, and I think uh, American um, indigenous terrorists, particularly uh, the white fascists and uh, uh, racists, uh, probably are also um, having some kind of connection maybe with, with white supremacists in Europe. What exactly that might be, it's hard to tell. But they also are concerned with America. That they need to they need to do whatever they do against the government here, against the state here, and they are also, of course, using probably religious rhetoric of um, you know Christian conservatism, extremism, and so on. So that there may be some similarities, I think, but uh, I, I, uh, as well as differences, but. It's a good question, I think. And I don't know a lot about the American, uh, um, you know, uh, white supremacists. Uh, we have some colleagues here that, that, that probably do know a, a whole lot about that. I wanna go to another question about um, the theological perspective. And, and this is, mm -hmm. um, do you think the issue of the wider Sunni Islam mm -hmm. that the Taliban have so misused mm -hmm. Um, uh, let me let me actually read the question because I'm 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 not getting it quite right here. From a theological perspective, do you think it is an issue of the wider Sunni Islam that the Taliban have so misused the faith of Islam, or is this misused, abused interpretation of faith going to bring religious tensions among Sunnis in other parts of the mm -hmm. world? 
I think this is a, 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 a ultimate question because there is no ultimate um, decider on matters of faith in Islam in general and Sunni Islam in particular. Iranians have their rankings. You, you have Hujjat al-Islams and you have you know, Ayatollahs and Grand Ayatollahs and so forth. And ultimately there is somebody who can, uh, if there is a you know, issue in interpretation, um, a fatwa or something, somebody can say, hey, um, I'm, I'm the last one to decide on this and here is my decision. And there are centers like uh, Qom and there are you know, Kufa and, and whatnot in Iraq. Sunnis have none, none. It's the most democratic religion, <laughs> you, you know, sect you can find because uh, everybody essentially defines and determines for, for themselves. There is no ultimate authority. And that is the real challenge, I think, for Sunnis and for the Muslims in general, that unlike the Christian church or churches um, that have some kind of hierarchy and, you know, uh, whether it's Mormons, whether it's Catholics, whether it's, you know, anybody, they have a, a, a structure through which you go and um, uh, somebody makes decision. There's nothing like that in Sunni Islam. There are places like Azhar, but again, it's, it's a problem of nationalization of Islam. Islam has become nationalized. This is the worst thing that has happened in the 20th century. And I think the poison of nationalism has been perhaps that the strongest weapon that has been used against Muslim societies by nationalizing their faith. And so everybody has their own sort of, you know, my, my interpretation is the right interpretation. So Turks can take pride on, you know, Turkish Islam and Saudis on Saudi Islam and Iranians on Iranian Islam and Pakistanis, Indians, whatever. And that's part of the problem. I think Muslim, uh, Sunni Muslims need to work towards the creation, towards the creation of some kind of arbiter your know, arbitrary um, entity where they, whether they elect them, select them, you know, create some kind of council uh, where um, major issues of contemporary, um, you know, nature could be brought and resolved. And somebody could say uh, Taliban interpretation on gender on you know, all these issues and their abuse of say, Amr ibn Maruf, Nayan al-Munkar, or um, their use of uh, hudud law, these are unacceptable. They don't match the spirit of the Quran. There's a lot of good scholarship, but it needs to be uh, put into some kind of a structure where um, you know, Muslim nations would come to accept that. But I think given nationalistic, uh, you know, um, sentiments that are pervasive, uh, I don't think that'll happen. But that's what they need to need to do if they want to come out of this miserable condition. Uh, you know, we can't we can't pull ourselves together as Muslims on anything. Thank you for that answer and for what has been just an excellent uh, program. I'm going to turn it back over to Ramazan to close us out here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, both the questions and, and uh, the willingness to listen for this long. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shahrani, for this wonderful lecture and very enlightening Q&A after that, that didn't only touch on Afghanistan, but Islam in general, uh, US foreign policy, Islamophobia. So it was really uh, a, a delight for us to be here and listening uh, to you. Uh, thank you also for everyone for joining us. Uh, I know it's a very busy time of the year and we had some students who had to leave at one because I know there are classes, mm -hmm. but we had really great attendance uh, and also we were enlightening and engaging questions with, which uh, shaped Absolutely. the second part of the lecture. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, Patrick for moderating, especially at a time when you were just departing. So you are joining us from the airport. And 
So that's really very kind of you. you have, uh, and uh, this is something that you do excellently <laughs> in an excellent way. And also our sponsors, Mentis Nebraska and Center for Afghanistan Studies. Thank you, Emily, for representing Center for Afghanistan Studies uh, today and giving us some information about it. And our usual uh, co-sponsors, Political Science, History and Religious Studies Department and uh, International, uh, International Studies major and Goldstein Center for Women's Rights. So thanks so much for everyone. I just want to mention that we will have another event on Afghanistan, on women in Afghanistan mm -hmm. in mid-March. Please stay tuned. Uh, the details are not set yet, so we, I don't want to give all the details, but we will have another event on Afghanistan. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahrani, for being with us today. My pleasure and honor, and thanks very much, every one of you, and also every one of the uh, community members who have uh, co-sponsored and has expressed interest in this, and everyone who uh, also participated in this. I really appreciate that. Uh, so Thank all the best, you. and thanks. Thank you.